In many places around the world today, November 11th is a special day, Armistice Day, Veterans Day, where we, remember, where we remember the end of one of the most horrific and cruel wars in human history. But honestly, uh, also from now forward, uh, Sheikh Ahmed, I will also always remember November 11th as the day that I got to meet you and hear your uh, reflections on life in the Sinai, the impact of climate change, and veteran people, so thank you. And I also uh, can't help but draw a parallel between Sheikh Ahmed's remarks and the discussions that I've been hearing in the Blue Zone at the COP. Because in the Blue Zone at the COP, uh, you hear a lot about how we're going to solve climate change through uh, meat being grown in test tubes and through electric vehicles and through Bitcoin. But I think we're going to solve climate change by listening to people like Sheikh Ahmed and listening to people like yourselves. And so that's really my dream, that in the future, the cops will be centering voices like yours, uh, along with the voices already there. But that doesn't have to be only a dream. It could be a reality, if we make it so. If we, people in this room, people like us, center and bring to the fore cultural voices as the solution to climate change. And that's really the premise of today's event, of Art, Culture, Heritage, COP27. How do we lift up and center culture at this COP? How do we lift up and center culture in tackling the climate crisis? And so thank you for joining us on this journey that we're starting today and that will take us all through the day and into the night. To formally open our event, I'd now like to invite to the front uh, our opening speakers, um, Dr. Hosanane, Dr. Othman, uh, Shannon Miller, Salma Sabor, Nadine, uh, Allison Tickle. If you could come to the front, um, we'll begin with our opening panel. I don't no please. I don't know anyone that has come into this museum without being uh, quite struck by what a fine institution it is, by the facility, by the collections. It's really quite an impressive place. Over the last few weeks, I've had the pleasure of working with the museum and the planning of this event, and I can tell you that the staff of the museum and the professionals that work here are as excellent as the facility itself. It's been a real pleasure, and for that reason, it's particularly my pleasure to begin our welcome panel by enter introducing you to the director of this museum, Dr. Mohammed Hosanen. Dr. Mohammed is an archaeologist by training. And he, he and his staff have been a pleasure to work with these uh, weeks, and I now give the floor to Dr. Hosanen for the purpose of introducing his colleague, Dr. Momen Othman, uh, who will then formally open our event. So Dr. Hosanen, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, actually, I have a great honor to participate in this particular event. Uh, and uh, I appreciate a lot your choice to hold your event in Sharm el Sheikh Museum that we have a big and important role in highlighting the cultural heritage in Sharm el-Sheikh city and its community. I would like to start by some hymen of Achen Aten, which were written here in our temporary exhibition, Egypt and its environmental legacy. When you rise up on the horizon, the day breaks, and when you give forth your days, people are alert standing on their feet that you have raised them up then the entire land performs its work i tried to tell you diamond of these words because of the end that word work work always we say actions speak louder than words so let's start fabulous and fruitful actions and go on further to have the chance to protect the cultural heritage. The cultural heritage plays a particular role in several fields of life and they have the power to do effects on what we face recently. 
We are looking forward to, you, to your discussions and the solutions today. I would like to thank all of you. Let us please intro Dr. Uh, Mu'min Asman, the head of museum sector of the Supreme Council of Antiquities. Uh, thank you. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Mohammed. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable speakers and attendants, at the beginning, let me welcome you and express my pleasure of being among you today in this important and particular event, which come among the events held in the framework of the conference uh, COP27. The, this conference came as a, a consequence of the great attention in which Egypt paid to climate change issue since it was one of the first countries that signed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in June 1994 and the Kyoto Protocol in March 1999 and finally Paris Agre Agreement in June uh, 29, uh, 2016. Today, I'd like to shed the light on an important axis revolving around the climate and the heritage, discovering the past and sustaining the future. Starting with the past, from thousands of years ago, the ancient Egyptians knew caring and preserving the environment. I'm sorry that we welcome Dr. Mustafa Waziri. The Secretary General. The ancient Egyptians knew caring and preserving the environment. Since what the ancient Egyptian practices in their daily lives and the documents they left behind clearly confirm that they, re they realized the meaning of the environment and its importance. And that the more they try to control it to build their civilization. We already knew that in the past, in ancient times, it happened also the climate change. And you are sure, uh, according to some evidence, archaeological evidence, and also some uh, scientific analysis made in some archaeological sites, that in uh, in in uh, in some periods in ancient times, uh, like the end of the old kingdom, some researchers studied this part, and they ensured that uh, the decline of the old kingdom, not because of uh, internal reasons, but because of sudden climate change, and also we have a big. Uh, uh, a uh, big researcher called Barbara Pell. She studied also the part of the uh, end of the uh, Middle Kingdom. And for the same reasons, because of sudden climate change, the decline of the, of the power of the authority uh, happened at that time. So the, in ancient times, it happened, but not in this uh, rapid, uh, uh, rapid uh, routine. Turning from the past to the future as for modern Egyptian state and within the framework of sustainable development, it was built uh, on this basis axis that the ancient Egyptian plant and included in the papyri and the drawing in the temples. It was the first sustainable city in history, namely the pyramids, sustainable agriculture, and the transformation of waste into a source of energy and the heating and the protection of the Nile, with technological development history repeats itself. Egypt's 2030 strategy to achieve sustainable development in all its aspects. The Ministry of Tourism, Antiquities and Antiquities have a plan to transform a number of museums and archaeological sites into green sites that's really not on solar energy as a sustainable and more economically available alternative to electric energy and to reduce carbon emissions. Today, uh, uh, 
Dr. Mustafa Waziri uh, will sign some of agreements regarding these uh, projects in uh, five museums and uh, other archaeological sites using solar panels. The implementation of these projects is so significant because it will achieve an important shift in the museum work confronting climate change phenomenon in addition to saving expenses, adopted the Museum Greening Initiative. In that context, it's important to mention that the Green Museum is a museum that incorporates concepts of sustainability into its operation programming and facilities. Green Museums, tackling the climate crisis, demonstrated the many different ways that museums are responding to the climate emerges. In order to answer the questions, how to be a Green Museum, we have to emphasize that the Green Museum features on or more of the following characteristics. An eco-sustainable architectures or bio-architectures, 100% energy, uh, renewable energy system, lead lighting or any other type of energy saving light bulbs, pollution and waste reduction measures, and the enabling of reuse and recycling, Promotion of sustainable mobility, for example, providing discount admissions tickets for those reaching the museum by public transport or by bike. Green innovations from providing a charging station for electric vehicles to promoting digital tickets to avoid paper waste. Educational initiative focused on sustainability both for museum staff and for visitors. In conclusion, Egypt has uh, numerous cultural heritage assets that exposed to climate change impacts in different degrees. So mitigation and adaptation action must be involved in all levels of planning in the cultural heritage sector, not just for current time, but for near and far future to be able to provide the resources for uh, competing uh, this impact on cultural heritage. It is recommended to develop a separate national strategy for the impact of the climate change on cultural heritage, which engage all players in this sector. It's not only a socio-economic sector that contribute to the national GDP and create jobs and opportunities to local community, but it's more than that of our historical cultures and the history that requires to be sustained and maintained. So it is recommended to organize capacity building activities to enhance the human capital of the Ministry of Antiquities and Specialists in Cultural Heritage Management to deal with the climate change impact in short and medium future terms. It is highly recommended to go beyond the restoration efforts to be more oriented by to the future planning and the designing of early warning system that support the decision making in the field of cultural heritage management. At the end, we express our sincere gratitude and thanks towards all the organizers and supporters of the wonderful coordination, co coordination of this event. Looking forward for promoting collaboration for future progress in achieving the desired objectives of confronting the climate change impact and preserving our, our cultural heritage. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Othman. With those eloquent remarks on the power of culture and cultural institutions, not just model the green transition, but help people imagine and realize what a climate resilient future looks like we can consider art, culture, heritage, COP27 well and truly open. Uh, Dr. Othman was mentioning the arrival of Dr. Mustafa Waziri, the Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities of Egypt. Welcome, Dr. Waziri, and we will have the pleasure of hearing from him presently. Uh, for the, uh, in consultation with Dr. Waziri. Uh, this uh, event, uh, is the result of a, it's a labor of love and the result of a lot of work by there and we'll thank um, 
at its inception, the Climate Heritage Network and the Culture Cup Network. Uh, Magical, delightful, wondrous, uh, and emphasis maybe on wondrous <laughs> that we're that that we're here together in this moment. Uh, but to round out this welcome panel, what we hear from from those uh, brief remarks that will give insight into the expectations and hopes of, and anticipation of those two networks uh, for why we came together and what we can accomplish while we are together. Uh, we'll start with my colleagues from the Heritage Network, and I'm pleased to be able to introduce you to Shannon Miller, who is the co-chair of the Climate Heritage Network for North America and the head of cultural heritage for the city of San Antonio, Texas, the seventh largest city in the United States, and Dr. Salma Sabor, who is representing the Climate Heritage Network's Africa region. And so, Shannon and uh, Salma, uh, tell us why the Climate Heritage Network is here today. Great, thank you so much, Andrew. Good morning, everyone. I'm Shannon Miller, and um, I am the, the head of cultural heritage in San Antonio, Texas, in the United States, and I'm really excited to be here today, my first visit to Egypt, hopefully my first of many. Oh, is it not? Microphone's not working? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll talk louder. Um, so as Andrew mentioned, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Climate Heritage Network, and the, the network is really a, a, a volunteer coalition of a diverse set of voices, all of whom believe that culture and climate advocates working together are stronger. And knowing that culture is a core climate issue, we're focused on growing the number of culture voices that are mobilized for climate action and want to help communities accelerate the far-reaching tra transitions that are needed to hold global warming, warming to 1.5 and to adapt to the changes in climate that we've already caused. In short, we're working to amplify the power of arts, culture, and heritage to help people imagine and realize low-carbon, climate-resilient futures. Um, climate action often suffers from a failure to imagine desirable ways of living not wedded to the carbon economy. And climate planning too often focuses on a narrow suite of technical solutions to the exclusion of less quantifiable dimensions, um, such as culture. Um, traditional climate planning is often missing the hope and the creativity. And sometimes those typical approaches fall short um, of the rapid and transformative change that is really needed. Um, so we believe that culture is the missing ingredient. And it's critical to that transformative climate action and climate resilient, sustainable development that is required. Change happens when culture from arts to heritage is used to empower people to imagine and realize low carbon climate resilient future, especially through place-based and people-centered approaches. So we are really here today to explore those linkages. And we're so happy that you all have joined us and I'm honored to be a part of this conversation. Thank you, Shannon. Um, so my name is Salma Sabour. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I'm really glad and happy to be here. And uh, that the fact that at COP27, culture has a voice and has a, a space and a place to be. As you know, the African continent, including its communities, lands, values, heritage, and cultures, is one of the most vulnerable to climate change. The IPCC reports mentioned different tricks, risks of climate change, including culture this year, specifically in Africa and heritage. Um, among those risks, you have species ex extinction, reduction of irreversible loss of ecosystems and their services, risk to food security, risk of malnutrition, risk to marine ecosystem health, to livelihoods in coastal communities, increased human mortality and morbidity, reduced economic output, increased risk to water and energy security, and the risk to heritage is something that is not talked about enough in the media, at COP, and this is why we are here. African heritage, including cultural, natural, cultural landscapes, mixed heritage are of immediate concern to those of us who work on the conservation of heritage values and assets. For example, currently, 56 coastal world heritage sites, both natural, cultural, and mixed, are at risk from extreme coastal events, 
including the iconic ruins of Tipasa in Algeria and the North Sinai archaeological site here in Egypt, where we are. Managers of these sites are in the front line of dealing with super complex social ecological systems and have to deal with increased complexity of management in the climate change context that sometimes are even higher than what you can experience in cities and urban areas. We are delighted and grateful for all the support that we have received from all over the world to bring four heritage, African heritage managers from World Heritage Sites in Tanzania, Uganda, Benin, and Nigeria to share their stories, their challenges, and how they are building a strong knowledge infrastructure and new tools integrating scientific, local, and indigenous knowledge to respond to, climate, to the climate emergency. Examples of the key uh, elements that heritage managers can bring to the, this discussion is that heritage sites in Africa are already affected by climate change impacts, increasing the vulnerability of the social ecological systems they maintain, including physical, cultural, natural assets, communities, and values. Assessing climate vulnerability begins with asking local people what they value about their communities and their heritage. And today, even heritage inventories and protected area documentation often don't tell the whole story. Translating data on climate hazards more generally into assessments of vulnerabilities of local knowledge and values is really challenging. Scientists are not able to do that. So we need cultural vo vo uh, voices to actually try and allow conducting local-led values-based integrated climate vulnerability assessments. Attention to all African heritage and to African heritage practitioners' voices that are representing interactions between local communities and indigenous communities. They work with and they interact with daily and the assets for which they are holding lively stories and histories, supporting education and culture, reveal insights that can allow a re-evaluation of principles and best practices developed elsewhere around the world giving a crucial perspective on supposedly universal discourses of global heritage adaptation to climate change that can be uh, linked to the African heritage culture. Thank you. Th thank you, Salma, and thank you for reminding us that mm -hmm. COP27 is the African COP. And we're um, centering that as we are here in Egypt on the African continent. Uh, I think in order to maximize the value of today, we will be uh, flexible uh, and uh, take advantage of having Dr. Waziri here to hear from him now. Uh, so it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Mustafa Waziri, who is the Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities in the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities of Egypt. Dr. Waziri, thank you for being with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Princess uh, Diana, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, once again, my name is Mustafa Waziri, archaeologist, Egyptologist. I've been working in Luxor for more than 30 years. The only thing that I can do in my life to dig and to reveal. Then, a couple of years ago, I was appointed to be the Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities. But I got to tell you something. I've noticed that everybody in the world, they're taking good care of the, what we call it, the climate change. When, a couple of years ago, they start to feel the danger. But in fact, 5,000 years ago, Egyptians in ancient time, they had to think about the climate change. You mean it, Mustafa? Yes. Do you have an evidence? Of course, yes. Look at the way to Wadi al Hammamat, the way to Qusir, the way to the Red Sea, where the ancient Egyptians used to make mining over there to melt gold. So they made a big fire to, to get rid of the CO2 that the ancient Egyptians, they realized after melting this kind of gold because of the big fire and ovens and kilns, what they did, they had to cultivate different kind of plants, different kind of trees, 
with our modern technology nowadays, if you start studying what kind of trees, those ones, you're going to see that the biggest percentage of taking the CO2 out and producing oxygen from this kind of plants that the ancient Egyptians cultivated uh, in uh, Wadi El Hammamat in the way to the Red Sea. Not only this, wherever you go in Egypt, wherever you see the kilns, wherever you see the, the ovens, we got used to make a lot of excavation and settlement areas. So we have noticed that we have kilns, we have ovens everywhere. So whenever I see kiln and oven, I start to search for the remains of this kind of trees that the Egyptian, Egyptians in ancient time, they realized how big the problem is. And at the time, they had no factories and they had no, uh, no, uh, no, uh, no uh, cars, no modern technology. Even with this, uh, less than one percentage of uh, CO2 or carbon, whatever, they had to get rid of it immediately. So they had to, to take a good care of their environment. How about nowadays? Of course, we do have a lot of problems. For whom they have been in Egypt, for whom they have been in Luxor, my advice, to take the cruise between Luxor and Aswan. But when we stop in Luxor, you're going to find that all the Nile cruise is just right, ducking right in front of Luxor Temple, which is just a couple, uh, couple of meters away, a couple of feet away from Luxor Temple. So, as the Egyptian government, as the government of Luxor, as the Supreme Council of Antiquities, nowadays we try to enlarge the port, the Corniche of Luxor. This is what we are doing nowadays, to let the boat duck away from the city itself. Because of, you know, the Nile cruise, they have to keep the engine 24 hours a day working. Because of the kitchen, because of the air, because, 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 because. Mr. Moamin, the head of the museum sector in Egypt, he was talking about that in a couple of minutes, I'm going to sign the contracts for a couple of museums. We're going to turn them to be green museums. We started already in Cairo with the NEMIC National Museum of Egyptian civilization. And my advice again, for whom they've never been Cairo, or they have been in Cairo and they have not got the chance to visit this museum, please go. This, the, this is the museum with the 22 royal mummies, uh, with the mummy buried that we did. So go and visit. I think that's what I've heard from this beautiful lady. She said, ah, well, the first time for me to be in Egypt. No, oh, come on. No, you should come once and twice and three times to see the modern, the modern and the new and the latest discoveries, discoveries in Egypt. Just uh, Google it. Check uh, this Netflix or any kind of uh, discovery or Smithsonian or whatever. The last couple of years, Egyptian missions, they have been working almost everywhere in Egypt and they did a lot of new excavations could impress the entire world. I don't know if you're going to have the chance one day that I can give you a lecture for 25 minutes to show you what we discovered the last couple of years. 25 minutes to show you the update discoveries in Egypt. So do we take a good care of the climate change and do, do we feel how dangerous is this one? Of course we do. We started already before this COP27. We started a couple of years ago. We started to make a bit of consolidation, conservation, restoration to, to most of the open air uh, antiquity sites to protect it from this kind of, of pollution. We do care, we do care. I hope that you will have great uh, conference and I hope it will be a very successful one. I'm not gonna say goodbye because I hate this word. I can see those lovely round smiley faces everywhere. So I'm quite sure that I'm gonna see you once again in Egypt, especially next year. Why next year? Because we are planning, inshallah, to open the Grand Egyptian Museum next year, which is already Green Museum. They got the eyes of Green Museum. Grand Egyptian Museum is going to be a gift from Egypt to the entire world in the century number 21. For the first time in this museum, you're going to see those 5,398 pieces of the collection of Tutankhamun, collection in one museum. Before that, 122 in Luxor Museum, a couple of uh, hundred in Cairo Museum, a couple of thousand in Storage Magazine, but now for the first time you're going to see them in one, uh, displayed in one museum. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I wish you all the best.
thank you so much, Dr. Waziri. Thank you, Dr. Huthman. Thank you, Dr. Hussain. It's, it's really been a pleasure to work with the ministry in this project. So I mentioned at the outset that this event, Art, Culture, Heritage, COP27, is a collaboration between two networks. And we heard a moment ago from the Climate Heritage Network, and now it's my pleasure to invite you to hear a little bit about Culture Cop, the other network indispensable to this event. And for that purpose, um, for that purpose, I'm uh, pleased to be able to introduce Nadine Wahab. In Nadine's day job, she's running an NGO, Eco Dahab. But we've taken Nadine away from that and pressed her into service as the project manager for this event. And it is not a not a, a overstatement to say that this would not have happened without Nadine. And so, um, uh, Nadine, you have all of our thanks, uh, and we'll be uh, echoing that thanks all day. But in this moment, tell us a little bit about Culture Cop and also what you uh, have in mind for us for the rest of the day. Nadine? Um, <coughs> thank you all for joining us this early morning. Uh, I'm sure that there's a, um, everyone had a long night. Um, so I'm just going to tell you about my experience, uh, how I came to join Culture Cop. Um, I think that we all understand intrinsically the importance of culture uh, in our daily lives. It's the words we speak. It's how we think. It, it actually builds behavior. And so when someone said, uh, uh, so I'm, uh, as uh, Andrew said, I'm a a uh, climate uh, activist, not so much, I'm an environmental activist more, when someone said it's important to bring culture into the environment, I started giving that uh, a lot of thought and I always knew it because I work on changing behavior and that to me seemed like a little sort of eureka moment. And I will challenge everyone and I've challenged this several times with Culture Cop for everyone to think of the word and it was used uh, quite recently to, uh, to uh, describe uh, the Grand Egyptian Museum um, uh, by Dr. Waziri, what's the one word we think of when we think of environment or climate? It's green. That is how we think of the world. And this is what the importance of culture is because the environment is not green. It changes from place to place. In Sinai, it's gold, it's orange, and it's blue. And so when we start talking about green charm, we're actually not talking about green charm. We're actually talking about charm that is these golden and brilliant and vibrant colors. And that's the, the attempt of Culture Cop, is to really understand how culture affects how we think about these issues and integrate them into how we talk about climate. And specifically, talking about climate uh, justice means understanding deeper how we talk and how we express the environmental and the climate uh, issues that we face every day in a way that doesn't negate or disenfranchise or remove or isolate different cultures. One of the key aspects of Culture Cop is bringing indigenous cultures and traditional values. And this is where Clim um, Climate Heritage Network and Culture Cop really do combine because heritage and climate are very, very integral on how we should move forward. Thank you, Nadine, and you'll hear from uh, numerous uh, Culture Cop colleagues throughout the day, uh, especially in the afternoon when we have the Culture Cop assembly. Uh, the final person on this welcome panel that I uh, have the pleasure of introducing you to is Alison Tickell. Uh, Alison is the founder and director of a social enterprise based in London called Julie's Bicycle, but, but that only scratches the service, uh, surface of Alison's contribution. She, she's really a, a thought leader who was among uh, the first people in the modern era to uh, make these connections between culture and tackling the environmental and biodiversity and climate crises. And she has somehow sustained that passion and leadership um, for a great while. And so uh, we are all in Allison's uh, debt for her leadership and her example. Uh, and we're lucky to have her here today. In fact, um, if Allison has one failing, it's that apparently she doesn't know how to say no to a request because she's agreed to be with us all day and to be our MC. And so thank you, Allison, for this um, extraordinary gift of your time. And so uh, it's my pleasure now to hand the baton, the microphone, 
over to Allison, who will take over as the MC for the day. And Allison will uh, close us out of this panel in a very special way that she'll tell you about. And uh, then we'll continue for the rest of the program. So Allison, my pleasure. Thank you so much, Andrew. So thank you, everybody, for coming. It really is such an honor uh, for me and for uh, all our colleagues at both Climate Heritage and Culture Cop to be here today at this, what feels like a, a really significant uh, moment for culture and for COP. Because as Andrew said, I've been in this, um, in this space, uh, actually for a very short space of time in the context of so much that we've heard from, uh, from colleagues already. Um, but just in this moment, um, I've been here for 15 years, um, working to bring culture and the creative community into the heart of um, our understanding of climate, of environment, of justice, actually as probably the most precious jewel we have, the one that's been the least polished and yet is the most important to shine. And it has never felt that we're closer to that moment. Um, and I feel that today is going to be a very significant day for culture in this context of uh, political negotiations around how to tackle this monumental uh, uh, problem that we all share. Um, today, obviously, is a, a wonderful gathering of culture, of organisations and communities, individuals, keepers of the past, artists and makers, poets, philosophers, and justice advocates of our present and our future. And we're sure that this will mark a big day over in the green and the blue gated zones that uh, that constitute uh, these spaces that we're we're allowed to legitimize uh, the climate uh, and culture because of course and everybody said this and we'll hear it again and again but we can't state it strongly enough that culture the creative community heritage the arts fundamentally they are speakers of truth and right now we need to look right into the heart of the problems that we're facing, the tricky issues that we, we have, and we need to, all of us to speak to truth. Um, that includes centering justice, centering the communities, many of whom are represented in this room, um, and the millions of people around us who are suffering so, so uh, extremely from climate and, and nature crisis, um, and speak to the heart. I'm so pleased um, also to say that the Climate Heritage Network has been working tirelessly for quite a long time on pulling together a manifesto that speaks to and from us all. Um, and we are going to launch it a little bit later with um, Andrew. I do have some paper copies that my, um, my Airbnb, uh, they, they, they um, very kindly allowed me to um, print. There's, one in Arabic, Spanish, French, and English, if you'd like to have a look. But they're also online, and we will, we will forward the email, um, the, 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 uh, the web address later. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but I am going to mention the manifesto all the way through, because for those of you who haven't read it or haven't signed it, we would really welcome um, your, your joining this community of commitment. So uh, fundamentally, obviously, this manifesto is about how we meet pa the Paris Agreement, uh, making sure that actually we, can, we commit with all our hearts to a 1.5 limit. Obviously, there's mitigation. Obviously, there's ad adaptation. And one of the most exciting things this year is this huge elevation around loss and damage. Um, and that is so critical to culture. Um, the manifesto talks about culture leading change through connecting people and communities, past, present and future, with awareness and action, using culture as the most powerful tool for climate mobilization. And I'm sure you will all agree with me that that's what we're here today to do. So welcome. I am going to be a timekeeper of some of sorts. So if I hurry you along, please don't be offended. It's just we have such a blessing of riches uh, to hear from in this room um, that I just want to make sure that we manage to do that as, as well as I can. Um, and 
I'm, I'm really happy to be able to, went, to welcome now one of those extraordinary uh, uh, moments for you. Um, I'd like uh, to very happily welcome Namin El Rawi um, to the stage. For those of you, for those of you who don't know, uh, Namin is is, is a wonderful singer, uh, Egyptian singer, and well known for her repertoire of Un Kulthum, and is a real honour to have with us today. Thank you so much for for joining us. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Reem Abdul. I am also known as the artist Dreamy, and it is an honor and a pleasure to be here. These are my homelands. I come to you as a full blooded Egyptian and also as the daughter of diaspora. I come to you as an artist who's found that my art has been a vehicle for negotiating my relationship with the earth. I was once in the political space, I was once in the humanitarian aid space, and found that a memory of the way in which my ancestors understood their relationship to the earth was through song, was through dance. That our song and our dance was not just our prayer and our celebration, it was also our vehicle for grief. It was also our way in which to communicate with the forces of the natural world. It's not just talks and conversations. It's not just political laws or money exchanged. It is a deep and devoted reverence and relationship with the earth that we have come here to fight for. It is the understanding that we are not separate from the earth, that we are the earth. And like her, we too contain the same amount of water the same need for nourishment and the requirement for the family of things. We've heard Masr Umm Dunya, Egypt, the mother of the world. And so it's no mistake that we're here and that we've gathered together after all these years of isolation now, separation, fear, and crisis. So I come to you, we come to you, mother, embodiment of water, as a mirror and a metaphor for our return to the remembrance of who we are, where we come from, and what we've come here to do together. We begin as all our ancestors do, and all our contemporaries do, especially in these lands, we begin with a blessing. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, I present to you, Nermeen Al Rawi. Wahyat Habib, Bakin Nabi, Wahyat Sia Ramadan. تقبل صلاتي ودعوتي وقراءتي القرآن وحيا حبيبك النبي وحيا صيام رمضان 
تقبل صلاتي ودعوتي وقراءتي القرآن وقف على بابك وقف على بابك جيت لك وبلجأ ليك واللي بيلجأ إليك ما بتودهوش زعلا اقبلني يا رحمن اقبلني يا الله اقبلني يا الله اقبلنا يا الله يا مصر يا حفظ قرآنك وانا ولو تناديني من الغربة انا جيلك في وقت الشدة ادعيلك وانا جيلك ومهما تموت هنا اجيال انا يا صبحة متعطرة من حلفة للأنطرة يا صبحة متعطرة من حلفة للأنطرة أنا اللي دمع اشترى أغلى مواويلك مكتوب لغني لك وغزل مواويلك مكتوب لغني لك وغزل مواويلك ونجفي نبع الحب يروي عسلني لك عشت في مهدي ابتدى وانا دمعي قطرة ندى عشقك في مهدي ابتدى وانا دمعي قطرة ندى علمني اول ندى يا غالية ادعيلك ممكن معايا بقى مكتوب لغني لك وغزي المواوي لك الحافظ يقول مكتوب لغني لك وغزي المواوي لك ونجف نبع الحب يروي عسلني لك يا اللي الذهب شعرك ما فرد على ظهرك يا اللي الدهب شعرك ما فرد على ظهرك لو أمتلك مهرك حقيد لي أنديلك مكتوب لغني لك وغزي المواوي لك مكتوب لغني لك وغزي المواوي لك ونجف نبع الحب يروي عسلني لك يروي عسلني لك يروي عسلني
والله احنا عندنا برنامج كبير قوي علشانكم بس بنحاول نظبط الايكويبمنت بتاعتنا والمزيكا بتاعتنا وهنرجع لكم تاني ان شاء الله <تصفيق> She said we had a whole performance plan for you, but we know there's a lot of other things happening. But for a moment, feel into what your body feels like, maybe the smile on your face, or the activation of your skin, your heartbeat. Feel the way in which you are awakened and energized by the song and the dance. Even if you do not understand the words, you feel the prayer. And that feeling is the energy which will move us into action. That feeling is the energy which will keep us strong regardless of the crisis. Our ancestors knew this, our mothers know this, our elders know this. May we remember this. Shukran. <laughs>